Good evening. Thanks very much for joining us. My name is Patrick Harvey. I'm one of the Scottish Green Party's co-leaders and I'm our candidate in Glasgow, Kelvin. We're having a, a discussion tonight about the climate emergency because it is obviously one of the critical themes in the Scottish Green Party's election campaign. But it's, it's also something that all the political parties are now starting to respond to. And one of the things that's changed uh, over the, the years is the way that all political parties are now starting to, to use the same language. If you've been following the campaign, you'll have heard every single political party from left to right use language like climate emergency, zero net zero society, just transition, that kind of language is floating about all over the place. From the Green point of view, we often challenge uh, whether the other parties are following through uh, to add to that language with bold, radical action that's, that's necessary. Back uh, a dozen years or so ago, uh, Scotland was debating its first climate bill, and I had the privilege at that time of chairing the parliamentary committee that was leading the, the scrutiny on that bill. And it was a really interesting time because every single political party, I can honestly say this, was moving amendments to try and strengthen the bill. A lot of countries find that kind of dynamic really hard to achieve. Uh, there was no coherent climate denial movement at that time, in Scotland anyway. Uh, a few fringe voices, but nothing substantial. None of the political parties were trying to undermine the legislation. And in fact, the, the final debate on that bill became a little bit of a bidding war. Each political party saying, we are committed to an even stronger target. And it kind of set the scene for years after that of backslapping about what brilliant world leading targets we've got. And I remember in the final debate on that bill, I was already saying, I'm, I'm pleased that everyone's talking about this and agreeing that targets are necessary because they are. But I don't honestly think that most of them have thought through the level of political, social and economic change that is required to meet those targets. And now here we are, Scotland has been repeatedly missing those climate targets that have been set. So in many ways, we need to ask what is necessary beyond the rhetoric, beyond the, the setting of targets. And one of the things I find interesting about this election is that we don't see that bidding war. The political parties aren't trying to outbid each other for setting an even more ambitious world leading long term target. Uh, they're being challenged to take radical action now. Uh, and some of them are you know, willing to acknowledge that things like transport policy need to change, but they're still pursuing a road building program. They're still pursuing uh, maximum oil and gas extraction. So for the most part, the other political parties are still saying we can have climate action and climate targets as well as doing all the bad stuff that we were already doing all along. And from a green point of view, you can't have both. As the candidate in Kelvin, I'm really aware, and I think people in this community are really aware, that in a few months' time, the, the world's eyes are going to be here. Uh, assuming the, the COP, the, the Global Climate Conference, goes ahead, which I really hope it does, uh, it will be here in Glasgow Kelvin at the, the SEC on the banks of the Clyde. And I think it's going to be really critical that we demonstrate by our action that we can change the domestic conversation on climate. So we don't just talk about climate emergency, but we actually come forward with an emergency response. So those are some of the things that we're going to be discussing, what that means for Scotland, for our politics, and for communities right across the country. So I'm really pleased to be joined tonight by two of the Scottish Green Party's leading candidates, two of our fantastic lead candidate team. And they, they represent uh, Scotland from top to bottom. We have uh, Ariane Burgess, who's our lead candidate in the Highland and Island region. Uh, and we've got Laura Moody, who's our lead candidate in the South Scotland region. So thanks to both very much for joining us. I wanna talk a little bit about uh, your own roles and the work that you've done. Laura, you uh, were pretty involved in the, the Citizens' Assembly on climate uh, and the, the steering group for that. And this notion of deliberative, participative democracy, uh, a big part of the idea of it is, to ask people, how do we deal with the stuff that politicians very often fail to deal with or uh, or find difficult to deal with because of the, the short-termism and the tribalism? 
how how was that experience for you and, and what have you learned from it oh, brilliant and, and it's still going on there will still be some more meetings of the the stewarding group um going forward um actually uh, if we're elected as msps in may one of the first things we'll actually deal with is the interim the report um they, they released a sort of interim um brief report before parliament went into recess um but the full recommendations will be coming forward uh, before before the, the summer recess so it'll be one of the first things that um that the people will deal with in a new parliament and i hope they'll put some of the nice words they've been saying at the various events um, and that have been in manifestos for all the parties into action when that comes forward um that whole process was fascinating and um, it was something that the greens uh put into as an amendment into the climate uh, climate bill um, and one of the few things of that bill that i think we wholeheartedly were supporting um, despite our, our misgivings about targets because um, we're really committed to participatory democracy and the stewarding group's role um, was to help to set up the group and decide the shape of it and um, there are representatives from all the parties as well as a whole range of experts in participatory budgeting and, and participatory democracy people who've been involved in other assemblies across the world and um, a number of groups like Extinction Rebellion were involved for, for much of the early stages and, and the purpose was really to try and make sure that whatever came out of it was um, genuinely reflective of Scotland um, but also that um, it wouldn't be dismissed as being biased as being set up um, to, to come up with the answers that certain groups wanted to hear um, so there was lots of things to balance in that whole process in terms of how do you actually get a representative group of people um, you know essentially without it being a massive group of people we wanted around 100 people how do you get 100 people that genuinely represent scotland um, especially when you can't have anyone under 16 participating in an event like this so we had to do we actually did quite a lot of work to make sure that there were slightly more younger people involved than, than maybe proportionally there would be to counterbalance the fact there weren't any very young people and the children's um and the youth parliaments were involved in bringing evidence um and over a series of weekends obviously it all, all ended up happening remotely because it was all through the, the the pandemic um evidence was presented to the to the assembly members uh, and and discussed and throughout they had to bear in mind the question they had to answer and the question was what should Scotland do to tackle the climate emergency in an effective and fair way so it wasn't just what what, what solutions are there it was okay what can we actually do that will work will be effective but also will be fair and I think that's been really interesting in seeing what's come out of it and um, a lot of what's come out of it are things that we'll find you'll find in the Scottish Greens manifesto to be honest a lot of emphasis on warm homes on retrofitting mm -hmm. properties on, on on public transport especially in rural areas on active travel on how people work and some better broadband so people aren't having to travel so much um yeah a huge range of, of recommendations I think they narrowed it down to 16 key recommendations and also quite quite deep things um, that will really transform. So recommendations about looking at uh, gross domestic products, GDP, as a measure mm -hmm. of success and moving instead to more of a well-being economy. Um, so I'm really excited about the full report. I think what people have come out with is, is interesting. I probably wouldn't have picked the things that they came out with, but, but what mm -hmm. they did, they really responded to. And if anyone's interested in the evidence and the videos, um, a lot of that's online. So go and go and check out. I think it's climateassembly.scot or I have to remember yeah. the links. But if you search online for Citizens Climate Assembly, you'll find the video. One of the, a lot of the evidence. One of the traps that that sometimes climate discussion falls into is um, at one level you've got a very technocratic kind of top-down discussion about you know CO two parts per million and marginal abatement cost curves and all this kind of geeky stuff. <laughs> Uh, which we absolutely have to take seriously because it's led by people who really know their stuff and they spend their whole careers studying their stuff. And at the other end, you've got a, a kind of almost a sort of by a sort of opt in lifestyle type thing where it's about pushing all the responsibility down onto individuals. Uh, and, uh, you know, what are you doing? Are, are, are you doing your bet? What kind of lifestyle changes should you make? And, you know, 
what we very often talk about is the is the need for system change for for governments for uh, you know the the economy for the way that we run our society to change, and sometimes that 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 gets missed uh, in amongst this kind of very technical geeky discussion and the very individualistic lifestyle discussion. Did you feel that the the assembly participants, the members of the assembly, um, managed to get their teeth into the, some of those 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 issues and and figure out how to uh, how to connect these these sometimes disparate aspects of the the debate? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there were definitely people participating in the assembly who had personally taken more of a lifestyle approach to it. You know, people who'd adopted veganism, for example, or um, other other elements of the lifestyle change, quite radical lifestyle change that's quite personal. But looking at the recommendations, it's clear that actually they, they've clearly taken on much more of this sense that, OK, there's a finite amount that individuals can actually do to change things. And yes, we should encourage behavioural change where that's doable. But I think one of the really important things about, <clears throat> excuse me, having the effective and fair wording mm -hmm. in that question was about, well, how do you enable, uh, I mean, to me, in terms of what government should be doing to address climate change, what it should be doing is making sure that the most climate friendly choice is always the easiest and the cheapest choice, um, because th those it's not always that way. And, and, and if government can intervene in a way that makes that as easy as possible for people, for example, by supporting um, retrofitting homes so they're more energy efficient, um, that, that, that encourages that change with, in a fair way, without having to rely on people who are often very time and very cash strapped to make changes. I, I often feel that one of the most important individual uh, actions that we can take is activism, uh, is is making the case for for political change and, and system change. And Ariane, you've you've been involved in in climate activism not just here but in in New York as well. Tell us a, a little bit about what you were what you were up to there when you were spending time in the US. Wow, uh, a lot. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So. Um... Where to begin? Um, we we fought well. So yeah, one of the big campaigns that I was involved in was around community gardens. What's that got to do with climate change? It's about local food production, uh, but it's also about uh, creating spaces where people can come together and start to talk about the issues. So we had a massive campaign. Um, Thousands of people got involved in it, where the then mayor, who's now notorious Rudy Giuliani, uh, everyone probably <laughs> knows who he is. Well, so he decided that he had a vendetta against the community garden movement, and uh, he basically put in one fell sw swoop 124 community gardens that had been in the city for 30 plus years, created by people just you know doing it because they loved it and creating better neighborhoods. Most of them are in neighborhoods of multiple deprivation. So massive upswelling of activism happened, and uh, we were we were successful. And it was the the activism that we employed was very actually. I think we were maybe precursors to a lot of what's going on with Extinction Rebellion, where it was like um costumes and you know dramatizing and being creative and you know and that were, it was a tactic to get in you know get photographed to be in the press uh, so that was an amazing experience and then from that the kind of group of people we basically worked as well on a number of levels we knew that we needed fundraising so there were people that were comfortable with the raising of the money and there were the people that were really into the whole kind of legislative aspect of it so working at city level getting the legislation changed to protect the gardens and then also legal uh, people who were kind of like dealing with those of us who were doing the direct action and doing lockdown and things uh, to help us you know um, get out of jail and so, so, so on and so forth. So it was a really incredible campaign that went on for six months and, and resulted in keeping all the gardens um, thriving. Uh, and it was kind of a beginning of a journey for me that um, I started to reflect on the climate emergency more at that point. I created a curriculum for uh, 10 year old primary school kids where I was kind of like stealth, try, um, we made giant puppets. We you know, uh, and and they they created a rap song, which I should probably get out because <laughs> it would be great to, for them to hear it. Uh, you know, for it to be out there. 
but I was kind of doing a bit of stealth of encouragement around becoming activists uh, around the issue. And I think that the activism in New York City was necessary at the time because I used to come home to Scotland every year and I was so envious about the fact that Scotland had a, a parliament and Scotland had Greens in the parliament. Scotland had, you know, at, at some point, um, you know, the Greens had pressed for the Climate Challenge Fund and there was this funding available to do climate initiatives. And so I was a bit envious of all of that. And I think that we had to kind of do this direct action because things were not happening in the United States at that point. And it was very, very difficult to get inside the political machine in that country mm to have a voice around the climate. I mean, you could at a more local level. So what is good about America is the fact that you've got the, the federal government, state government, and then New York City has its own government and, and they've got the autonomy to, to make changes. So they, they did start to do a lot of things, but um, it was, yeah, it was a harder thing. The other thing that we use a lot, sorry, I was just going to say in that US context, you do have a much more organized and powerful climate denial movement, both in politics and culturally. Uh, and, you know, it almost seems as though uh, in, in American society, not just in my American politics, any critique or challenge of capitalism is, is almost a, a, a kind of unpatriotic thing to, to say or do. Uh, how did you how did you kind of navigate that? Did you did you get hostility to what you were doing? Did you, I mean, from members of the public as well as from Rudy Giuliani and his, his buddies? Um, I, I, well, it's interesting because the community garden um, actions, I think, touched so many people. So there wasn't hostility. And I think that's partly why it was successful because it was kind of like, we need gardens, we need trees. People knew it, you know, even before people understood about climate and, and how nature is so important as a response to climate and carbon. Um, you know, it's just a well-being mental health thing. And I think people know that in the city. So in that case, um, we were it was receptive. But the, when I started to get into the climate curriculum, it's actually interesting because I had this amazing opening at a primary school, a middle school in Queens, where I was asked to work with a teacher. And I, and, and I could do whatever I wanted. So I said, I want to do, a, it was kind of an art space. I said, I want to do a curriculum on climate. Uh, and she was like, oh, okay. But she went with me on it and she really didn't know anything about it, but she just supported the process and it was incredibly creative. And the thing is, is that, um, so that was in 2006. In 2012, Hurricane Sandy hit New York City. Um, it, was, it, was, it was a superstorm Sandy. And she lived on the coast of Long Island and her house got hit, mm -hmm. um, you know, so she now lives somewhere else, but it was kind of like, you know, it, you can get the theory, but the real experience is, you know, br brings about change. So I think that's also nature, superstar, things like that. And big nature events do help people shift their minds and you do get big nature in America. But it is still, it is an onslaught. I mean, when I left New York City, one of the things that New York Climate Action Group was really working on was the whole fracking thing. So um, heartbreaking, the, the decision to open up all the farmland to the north of the city, just when you need to be growing food locally to start, um, you know, you know, the onslaught of fracking coming in and, you know, basically contaminating uh, the land and run off into the water systems. So that was a very long, hard um, fight um, that I, you know, then I got to here to Scotland and it was like, where's the fracking? Oh, it's it's in the south of Scotland. And, you know, fantastic. We had Greens in, in the parliament who could put pressure on. So I think that we are so fortunate that we have a political system that has this level of representation that people like Laura and I and yourself, we can stand in a region and we can and we can we can be elected because there is a certain percentage of the population that do want a green perspective that do want the changes that need to happen and that's what's created the amazing possibilities in scotland well let's let's talk a bit about what that means for scotland and for your regions as as well because you know i'm i'm very conscious that here in in glasgow kelvin uh, you know people people do have public transport, it needs to be cheaper, it needs to be more reliable, it needs to be affordable for everybody, but it's there. It's not as if, uh, you know, in, in some rural parts of the country, uh, there is a very clear sense that you just don't have access to that public transport. It's not there, it's not serving those communities. But we also, in, in a place like this, you know, 
very, very dense urban population. The challenge of getting those, those buildings off the gas grid over the coming years is going to be immense. And the scale of investment that's needed in our housing stock to achieve that, uh, that we can't just leave that to the market. It's just nowhere near going to be adequate. What, what would you say are the, the challenges that, um, that I might be less aware of uh, you know, here in, in, in Partick uh, that are relevant to your, your regions? And they're, they're much more diverse regions in terms of urban rural. What would you say are the, the challenges? Laura, do you want to chip in on yeah. this and, and how you think people are going to respond to the stuff that we're talking about? Yeah, I mean, certainly transport and, and, and fuel poverty are rural homes um, are, are probably my two biggest priorities. Um, in terms of fuel poverty, we have a, a dual problem in rural areas. Um, fuel poverty is def defined by people spending a certain proportion of their income on fuel. Um, and so we, we, in rural communities, we have poor housing stock generally. It tends to be older and not terribly well insulated. Um, it's often off grid, um, you know, not not necessarily just the gas grid, often sometimes off the electricity grid. Um, so it's often on oil or LPG. Um, and and you've, you've also just got the problem that um, people earn lower wages in rural communities. So if you've got less money and you, you've still got the same energy price as someone living in a city has. So it's this kind of triple whammy that people face here. Um, and, and, and as with cities, you know, older housing stock, high ceilinged houses um, are, are not entirely suitable for sticking in an air source heat pump. So there's a, a real complicated challenge in terms of making them more energy efficient and switching the energy supply for them. It can be overcome, but it's going to take real, real investment. Um, and politicians and sometimes like to to just uh, say to people, "We'll we'll we'll make things easier and cheaper uh, versions of what you're used to already." And it's sometimes harder to say, "Actually, we have a completely different solution to the problems that you have." More of what you're used to uh, is easier an, an easier sell. Sometimes, do you do you get the feeling that the communities you're talking about um, are ready to hear uh, about? completely different energy solutions, completely different ways of getting about redesigning our communities so that we have to travel less? Yeah, absolutely. Where, where I am, um, especially up the valley in the Glen Kens, there's a really thriving community. Um, they've just developed a new community action plan. Um, like a lot of communities in rural areas, they're getting community benefit funding from wind turbines. Um, but they're, they're really determined to use that to reimagine their communities and in quite radical ways that you know they're, they're taking on community ownership of buildings they're restoring them and making them more energy efficient they're whacking solar panels on the roof they're getting together to, to arrange um, mass retrofits of villages they've got community transport and bus services um, community arts organizations so there's loads going on and they've got a lot of ambition what they don't necessarily have is the support they don't have the financial support that they need what often especially bugs me i've spent a long time as a community organizer in the third sector is communities can get money to buy a building to do a purchase but what they don't always get is the long-term funding they need to actually see that through and and it relies immensely on on volunteers and again in rural communities often those volunteers are retired people who who you know they run out of energy they run out of steam and um, in some cases sadly they die and there's no younger people coming through to take up those 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 good jobs because they can't afford to not work and and these some of these volunteer jobs are, are full-time jobs so um yeah we, we've seen real radical investment in in really radical community ownership schemes in scotland um, we're hoping to see more of that the green supported south of scotland enterprise um ha having to prioritize community ownership uh, and we've really seen that come through with the Langham and more community buyout so more of that is what, what communities need. And, and if they're supported like that, they will look at, at fairly radical solutions. They know things can't continue as they are. And a lot of those, those issues will be familiar to you as well, Ariane. Uh, you know, the, the land reform agenda as well, particularly in uh, you know, parts of the, the country where you know, huge swathes of land are, are, are being used in, in ways that are really environmentally depleted uh, just to support things like the blood sports industry, when they could be, if they were healthy, uh, ecologically rich environments, uh, they could be much more 
economically productive in terms of good quality jobs, but also soaking up carbon. Do you do you get the sense that there's enthusiasm and an appetite for that kind of change? Yeah, I think there is. Uh, I'm, I'm getting such a sense um, during this campaign of people really wanting to have that kind of level of change. It's in pockets, though, and I think that is partly because of the, you know, because the whole kind of land patterns push people to the edges. So we have some really great, uh, similar to Laura, we've got some really great community buyout initiatives where people really are taking things into their own hands and um, building their own um, you know community built affordable housing that kind of thing but I think there's a struggle here in the Highlands and Islands with our depopulation so I, I learned recently that you know homeless homeless homelessness is just um, you know not being able to find a place to live in the village where you are uh, where you grew up where you came from and being forced to go to the city so to find a home that's a form of homelessness so that's something that we really need to tackle here and i i think land reform is is at the root of it um i meet too many young people who want to get on land they want to grow they want to become a food grower they want to yeah shape their lives and and communities also that want to do that. And it is just uh, impossible. The cost of land is just really outside of people's reach. So um, we, we definitely need to do something about that. But there are, you know, there are, there, I'm aware of communities with the housing, exploring the whole kind of renewable energy piece. Um, but it is this piece about the lack of support. I'm also aware of a community that wants to kind of take that model of, um, the zero waste model, but instead of zero waste, kind of carbon neutral model, like carbon neutral 2030. So what is it that a village would need? What kind of support would, what kind of legislation would need to happen at the level of the Scottish Parliament that could support a village that wanted to do that and, you know, and feed that support maybe through local authority, but, you know, some kind of uh, combination where a village can come together and say, that's what we want to do and that's what where we want to head and have them looking at okay what are our public transport so rather you know there's the network of public transport but then there's villages saying we want to do this we want to become carbon neutral and the next village wants that as well and this one wants it too so how do we work together and network those systems and look at a shared bus system for example so i do think there is radical change one of the things i love in our in our manifesto is the whole piece around supporting community organizers and people to facilitate the processes because I think that is one of the things I do a lot of community facilitation and I think it is missing because it's it's new for people to come together and start saying let's work together we've got to share more we've got you know we've got to try to find um, the ways to meet our needs more locally and those processes they you know people need help to do that well I think if anybody watching wants to fire in questions, uh, our campaign team will will send them on to me, and I'll I'll try and ask them. I've I've got one from uh, uh, Lindsay who's asking about electric charge points for for cars, and you know there are there's a range of views within I think the the green movement generally about whether electric cars are just a way of selling people another product, uh, sometimes quite an expensive one. Uh, instead of changing the way that we get about or changing the, the extent to which we travel. Um, you know, that's maybe easier for me to say here in, in somewhere like Kelvin, I can get to the other side of the city on my bike in, in 20, 30 minutes. Uh, you, you can't do that across the Highlands and Islands region or across the south of Scotland region. Um, but there are op opportunities, uh, as he says, for, for uh, more public transport. What's the role do you do you two feel about electric vehicles and are they uh are they a solution in their own right uh, do we need to see them in a in a wider context definitely i would say in a wider context so i am an electric car driver i do drive an electric car but um yeah i live two and a half miles from my nearest village six miles from a regular bus service i've got four kids you know i i, I with the best will in the world how if i really wanted to i could cycle those journeys but the amount of time it would take me out of my day just to take my daughter to her nearest nursery which sure. is um, a six mile trip there and back twice a day you, you know I, I don't have that time um so well, I you think can EVs, you can charge at home then do you I have can. access to a, a network are there enough points ar around the places you need to go 
yeah, when we got our electric car, we were, we, people said, asked us that a lot. And we said, actually, there's more electric car charging points within a 10 mile radius of my home than there are petrol pumps. Um, you know, we've actually got a reasonable number. And as range increases, um, yeah. it, it's less of an issue. But I do think it's still only part of the solution. I would still far rather only use the car when I had to and not have to use it all the time. And I would still far rather join up my journey. So my you know, electric car gets me to a bus, but ideally that bus would be very regular and that would take me onwards to, to, to the bigger towns where I do my shopping or connect up to the railways. So we really do need an alternative because not everybody can drive. Um, you know, tw even in remote rural areas like mine, 25 percent of people don't have access to a private car. Um, mm -hmm. When the UN rapporteur visited um, Philip Alstom a couple of years ago, he talked about rural public transport needing to be treated in the same way as as water and gas as really basic utilities. And it has to be provided. It has to be publicly owned. We have to accept that it has to be subsidized um, because otherwise yeah. it's just not fair. It's very unequal. No, I, I certainly feel that we should we should be entirely unapologetic about the use of the word subsidy. Uh, countries with a, a great public transport system they use subsidy, uh, and the you know it, it should be no surprise that if you just treat public transport as a market commodity, there will be an awful lot of market failure. Um, yeah. Ariane, did you did yeah. you want to chip in at this point? Yeah, just to add to the mix. So I am an electric car driver, but I don't own a car. <laughs> <laughs> and that's because I'm a member of a car share scheme. So that's another, okay. another layer. Yeah. So you can have, you know, you can you can have the car right outside your door, or you can be part of. I think there's probably about 150 of us uh, who live, you know, within a 10 or 12 mile radius, and that car share is actually doing really well, and it, it, it's expand. Well, actually, struggled a bit because of COVID, because less people were driving, but it still exists, and I'm so grateful for it. And it and it. You know, it's, it, there's some great things about it. There's choice. You know, uh, I'm going to go on a road trip, uh, hopefully soon, to do some campaigning, and I'm going to take an electric car for that road trip. Uh, so there's some electric cars in the fleet, and hopefully there will become more. So yeah, I think car shares can be one, and especially as more of us are going to looks like more of us are going to be working from home, and you don't need that daily that car for that daily commute. Yeah. I think it's definitely a way to go. But as Laura says, we absolutely need a much better joined up transport system. And, you know, we've got the rail for all plan. But uh, what I'm starting to really understand for the Highlands and Islands is that we need a ferries for all equivalent for the people who live in the islands. So that it's like I say that the rail uh, uh, initiative is the backbone or spine um, that kind of connects through or the arteries or something. And then you've got the buses that kind of take us to a more local level. And mm -hmm. then there's the car or the bicycle and so on and so forth. But ferries have to be that kind of same level of treatment uh, for our um, island folks. Well, I, I allegedly can drive in the, the sense that I have a document that says I'm allowed to, but you should all be extremely grateful that I don't because I was very, very bad at it on the, the occasions I tried. Uh, we've got a, a, a question uh, on solar as well. Um, you know, the, there's a maybe a, a, an assumption sometimes among people who haven't looked at it uh, that Scotland isn't a place with a lot of solar energy, that we can't use uh, solar either for electric uh, power or for, for heating. Actually, there's huge potential for, for solar and we could be uh, installing that in, in new build uh, as well as retrofitting it. Uh, you've presumably got communities that have have given that a shot. Uh, and, uh, you know, do you do you have any reflections on how we can restore some of the support for solar that was taken away by the UK government? I don't know about the support bit. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know about the support bit, but we definitely it would be good to get the money back. I mean, just in my town, we have a, a solar manufacturing company. I think it might have been the first one in Scotland, and uh, definitely there. I know people who have put solar on their roofs, um, both the PV and the for heating water, and um, it has. And actually, I know somebody basically their bills have been um, you know, partly to do with solar panels and so on and so forth, but also the insulation of the houses and the mm -hmm. orientation of the houses um, massively cuts the amount of 
um, you know, energy used to he heat the houses. So I think it's a combination of things. Um, I think it would be a good thing to to bring it back in and get the support. And you know, just as we're promoting the onshore wind, um, um, re-energizing that, I think that would the solar thing is something that people felt that they yeah. could take an action in themselves to do. Well, yeah, it, it connects it, exactly it, to, to transport as well. You, you mentioned the the wind when I when I was talking about the re-energizing onshore wind. Went took a, a visit to Whiteley Wind Farm uh, on my bike. I have to say, um, and they've they've just got a a parking bay that's covered in solar panels. It is connected to the to the electricity grid for for top ups and backup when it when the, uh, it's not generating. But the, the guy said it's it's generating more than enough uh, almost all year uh, to provide the, the the electric charging points. So people just uh, rock up. Uh, at White Lee, they'll go and walk the dog or take the bike out or, or whatever, and they'll charge their electric car while they're there. And it's it's all just coming from the sun. You know, it's it, for the most part, it's not having to take anything off the grid. Laura, yeah, what did I you mean, want to come in with? Yeah, well, I was going to say, we got solar panels on our house last year using the energy saving trust <laughs> scheme, thankfully. Um, and, and as of the middle of last week, it, it, it was generating enough energy to, to wipe out our energy use. And that's including charging the car overnight. So, yeah, I think people sometimes think solar energy sunshine. There's not a lot of that in Scotland. But, you know, if we get a lot of light and increasingly mm -hmm. photovoltaics are developing where it, it, it's about the light. Uh, and certainly during the summer months, we get uh, a lot of, of light. There's actually a, a planning application in the works near me for a, a, a big um, solar farm, effectively taking over some field with solar panels. There's a lot of delicate community negotiations going on around that and a, a lot of sensitivities about it. But in terms of mm -hmm. visual impact, I would say solar strikes me as much less visually impactful than the wind turbines. So. How, how is that community reaction then? Because, you know, obviously onshore wind has got a really important part to play. It's the cheapest and most developed uh, renewable uh, electricity generation that, that we've got. And there's there's probably more of a role for it. But sometimes it, it creates a reaction. Uh, my experience is that very often that reaction is about the anxiety beforehand rather than yeah. the impact uh, actually once it's built. But either way, more community ownership of that, more community control of it, uh, would uh, would make that mean that folk are, are thinking not about this as an imposition that's going to benefit some remote company somewhere, but a decision we can make as a community about whether it's in our interest to do this uh, and get the benefit. Are, are are folk thinking differently at all about the solar? Is it is it provoking a different set of reactions than wind? I think I think we're still at the anxiety stage for a lot of people, I think. But it's really interesting that there's quite an ingrained attitude in rural communities about um, farmers and landowners generally being allowed to do whatever they want on their land. And it's really mm -hmm. interesting how the expansion of renewable energy can often really conflict with that instinctive view. And, and I find it fascinating the cognitive dissonance that goes on between some people who would be, um, you know, really... Uh, affronted if, if somebody suggested that a farmer couldn't stick up a barn um, but likewise is, is horrified at the idea of them putting up a load of solar panels and <laughs> that, you know, quite often you can have solar panels and still graze the land and still work the land and you know it, it, it's really interesting seeing that that dichotomy and I think a lot of it is just the shock of the new um, yeah nobody's really attempted something on that scale in, in my community yet and so People are just really wary about about what that's going to mean. Mm -hmm. Change often leaves people, you know, uh, a, a little bit disconcerted. But change is coming, uh, and change has to come because we know that business as usual, the way that we've been running our economy, is not just breaching the environmental limits that the planet sets down. Uh, and you cannot negotiate with the climate and say, you know, please, can we just keep doing things the way we were? Uh, but also that 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 econ the way we've been running our economy has been socially unjust, divisive, and has has left a lot of people not getting the benefit even of of their own work. Never mind of the the wealth of the rest of the economy. Uh, I've got a question here about uh, why, uh, with independence, it says why not tax huge corporations and pump that money into green buses and better public transport? Well, why not indeed? 
But you know, I, I think a lot of a lot of what the Greens say about independence is yes, it would open up more possibilities, uh, and it would certainly give us the ability, for example, to change the nature of corporation tax. Uh, and we'll make the case for that. We'll make the case for that, and every every Green MSP elected will be campaigning for a, an independence referendum and for a, a yes vote and a green yes vision. But at the same time, we mustn't just hold off until that that possibility is opened up. We, we can work for it and, and work toward it and inspire people with that vision. But there are steps that we could be taking right now with, uh, you know, local taxation, changing that uh, in ways that uh, incentivize good, productive and environmentally sustainable land use. Uh, there are steps that we could be making now with the investment that's needed in, in public transport instead of road building. So uh, have you got uh, any kind of top picks of the, the things that we could do with independence uh, to address this issue in your communities uh, and your top pick of the, uh, the thing that's been waiting that we already can do that the Scottish Government hasn't taken action on yet? Well, my, uh, it's hard to have a top pick, but I think actually if we had independence, my top pick would be universal basic income, just because of the situation that people are experiencing in the region because of the pandemic and um, the economic fragility here because we're so dependent on tourism. So that's what I would like to see, because I think it's very difficult for people to think well about creating a future when you're struggling financially. So I would love to see us be independent and be able to bring that in and just give people that kind of sense of support um, and get them out of the struggle. So that'd be the top pick. And then what comes to mind when you ask, well, what could we do now? I, I would like to see, um, so housing is a desperate issue and we can, you know, we need to attend to that. And we've got that in our manifesto, like front and center really. Um, but what I see in my town and in Inverness, um, and again, because of COVID a change in the use of this, you know, this, the town centers and the city centers is more initiatives around partnership with local authorities and third sector organizations to create housing that is uh, built on derelict land that's just sitting there because, you know, so it's like that forcing of the, the taxation there, but also using the derelict land um, that can be used right away and getting housing going um, more centrally, because then that will also help the transport issue as well. Yeah, I thought it was interesting that you you pick on a, a, a social and economic policy like UBI, first of all, because the way that we live in the world is fundamentally conditioned by uh, those economic conditions that we uh, that we live with. And, you know, if we if we want people to to think about being open to change and open to a different kind of society and a different kind of economy, it has to mean more economic security for those uh, who've not been provided it in the past. Laura, any reflections on this? Yeah, I think, I mean, UBI is a great one, but uh, I, I think from, from my point of view, I think we really need to re-empower communities. A lot of rural communities feel uh, very neglected and overlooked. Um, and I don't think we can do that without radically overhauling our entire government system. Um, so, you know, we need independence to do that. We, we can do quite a lot on local government within Scotland. And there's a lot I'd like to do there. But really, we need to go back to basics and rebuild our system of government so that people can truly hold power to account and have a real say where they live locally. Um, and also, more broadly, the other split, flip side of that, only through independence can we get back into Europe and rebuild the relationships we're going to need with our neighbours uh, internationally to address climate and to address issues like uh, the need to have more migration. So, so to allow people in who are potentially climate refugees increasingly in the future, but also to allow people to bring their skills here to, to help to repopulate our rural areas. Yeah, I mean, I think that that issue of climate migration and, and climate climate refugees is something that uh, most of our political system is just not even engaging with, not even talking about it yet. But it's it's going to be it's going to be one of the issues that defines the twenty first century. Really, uh, listen, we've we've got one more question um, which we'll we'll maybe wrap up with uh, in the, in the next five or ten minutes, uh, and it's uh, if you're elected, what's the single biggest policy that you'd push for? 
that would tackle climate change in your region? And Ariane, I know you're, you're grinning. It's, it's one of these horrible questions. We all get it sometimes at the end of these debates. What's the one thing you would do? I'll, I'll, I'll start, OK? Could be here in, in Glasgow, uh, as I said earlier, one of the biggest issues is our housing. Uh, and not just the quality of housing and the, the insecurity that, that people, particularly in the private rented sector, have uh, and their inability to, to get investment in those, in those homes uh, to improve them and bring them up to standard. But, you know, our, our whole community has to end up not relying on these individual gas boilers and having tenement blocks where you've got fragmented ownership and fragmented tenure. Some people are owner occupiers. Some people are tenants of private landlords. Some people are tenants of social landlords, all in the same building. It's just not viable to think we can replace those gas boilers on an individual home by home basis. We have to be thinking about the whole building and the whole community. Uh, if we're going to look at whether it's, uh, you know, heat pumps, you know, a, a tenement would be far better said with one big heat pump in the back court uh, for the whole close rather than lots of individual little ones, whether it's district heating, uh, whether it's connecting to other renewable sources in the area, you're not going to solve those issues with each individual household thinking, how do I do this with my individual property? So taking that collective community wide approach to our energy challenges, that has to be one of the big ones. Uh, for uh, certainly for Glasgow, it's relevant everywhere. But you know, as I as I look out my window, I'm just seeing this density uh, of especially tenements uh, and some of some of the new build, um, you know, that's still been put up. We've still been building gas guzzlers uh, in the last five or ten years. Quite often, building it to a lower standard uh, than the tenements were built a hundred odd years ago. So. We've got a huge challenge to, to unlock the investments that's needed in warm homes, in affordable homes, in sustainable homes. So for me, for Glasgow, I think that's the that's one of the biggest challenges. Uh, how about the, the two of you then? Uh, Laura, your, your region. Uh, I know it's a, a horribly unfair question, but what's the, what's the one thing that you're, you're really passionate that you're going to push for uh, on climate for South Scotland? So I know we're promising to spend 895 million on, on nature restoration and, and that will create 6,000 rural green jobs. And that's what I really want to see. We've got a big problem in rural depopulation, um, which is just, it's just getting worse. And we're gonna need a really radical investment to change that round. So I'm really interested in some of the stuff we've got in our manifesto around workers' rights and jobs guarantees for young people. And I think that has to happen in in rural communities and we really need to push home and deliver those jobs in nature restoration, um, in renewable energy, uh, in you know, rain, outdoor ranges and access um, to make sure that there's um, hope and, and positivity in, in rural areas and, and something to keep young people there. So I think they're, they're the sort of things that are my priorities. And Ariane, Highland and Islands. Well, <laughs> well there's a really wonderful thing in the in the um, Scottish Green Manifesto. I think it's called something like the Green Infrastructure uh, Green Infrastructure Investment Package. So I'm going to cheat a bit because that has housing, <laughs> public transport, renewable energy, and nature <laughs> restoration in it, and it's one thing. So the, that's what oh, I'm right. like. so the, the, the biggest single thing is all the things. Is that your answer? It's all, it's all the things. I mean, that's absolutely what we have to do. But of course, you know, well, of course, we've touched on it too. But land land reform. You yeah. know that that you know that kind of like is the foundation upon which so much more could happen, um, and I think people Scotland would really flourish if we could just uh, course correct that that historic um, legal uh, mess that has you know led to blood sports and a kind of scarring of the landscape. But yes, no, but the infrastructure package, I think I'll go for that. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking you to do the rail ways. one because I knew you, I know you loved rail for all, so I thought you were going to go. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is, as I say, in many ways, <laughs> in, in many ways, it's an unfair question because Greens, you know, constantly, and anyone who's been to a Green Party conference will recognise this. As soon as you start with one topic, it connects to everything else, uh, and you know, a big part of the the Green message is the big vision, is the the how issues connect with each other, how people connect with each other, uh, and how we can build a, a society that's functioning. Uh, and so seeing it in these kind of atomized, you know, individual issues just on their own doesn't really add up. 
So a great deal of, of what we are talking about in this election is that big picture, that incredibly compelling, positive vision uh, about the, the Scotland we can build. We've got two weeks until polling day. You may already have cast your vote. You may have your postal vote sitting on your, uh, your kitchen table waiting for you to get around to it. Uh, if you've been tuning in tonight to, uh, tuning in, what an old fashioned phrase. If you've been watching tonight uh, because you genuinely haven't made up your mind and you were interested to hear what we had to say, I hope you find it compelling. You can look at the, the Green Manifesto on the, the Scottish Greens website. Uh, and uh, I genuinely hope that whatever way you end up deciding, uh, obviously I want you to vote Green, uh, but I hope you vote like our future depends on it because the decisions that are gonna be made by the next Scottish Parliament, by the MSPs who are elected two weeks today. Uh, the decisions about the climate and nature emergency, the decisions about how we recover from COVID and build a stronger, fairer, more resilient society, the decisions about how we close the wealth uh, and income inequality gap in our society uh, and you know build a, a future for us all where uh, we have a, a chance of, of being healthy, being safe, uh, and having a, a positive role and a, an engagement in our society. These are life critical choices that are gonna be made by the next session of the Scottish Parliament. I want to see Laura and Ariane and all of our other fantastic lead candidates in there as part of the Green Group. Uh, and I can, I can promise you that we'll carry on making a, a positive impact for, for Scotland as we have done in the last session. Thank you very much for, uh, for being with us tonight, spending part of, uh, part of Earth Day with us. I um, always feel a little bit odd about saying happy Earth Day because you know we, we'd only be happy once we once we no longer have to be so so worried about these incredible challenges. Uh, but uh, I hope you've enjoyed the discussion, uh, and I I hope as I say that you'll vote like our future depends on it. Thanks very much and good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.